Please start. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, can you please. Yeah, start. okay. Yeah, um, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to this conference. And I'm very sorry that I'm not there. Um, I'm currently the chairperson of uh, UC Davis. And I'm also teaching, so it was very hard for me to get away. Um, so please excuse me, but once I'm uh, not chair anymore, which will be after July, uh, I'm hoping I can travel again and I will be able to come to Japan again. So what I want to talk about uh, in the three lectures um, for this conference, uh, uh, about I, I want to talk about CRISPR bases. And in particular, in the first lecture, I want to give you some applications to symmetric functions. In the second lecture, I want to talk about some uh, recent work uh, with Stefan Fanera and my two students, Mary Claire Simon and uh, Joseph Pape, um, which uses virtual crystals, which I've worked with, uh, with Professor Okado and also Professor Shimozono. Um, and uh, we apply that to promotion and also some cyclic sieving phenomenon. And then in the last lecture, in lecture three, uh, I want to talk about some recent work uh, with uh, Rosa Orellana, Mike Zabrocki, um, and Franco Saliola about diagram algebras, insertion algorithms, and plethysms. So that's the, the basic outline for, for my three talks. Uh, but before I begin, uh, I want to say happy birthday uh, to Masato Okado. Um, these are some pictures from 2015 when I actually visited Japan. Um, and he, he bought that toy, which you can see on the left, and I still have it. So it was a very good visit. Okay, so let me begin by uh, talking about the the topics of the first lecture. So in particular, what I want to do is I want to give you a crystal for stable Grotendieck polynomials, or actually a special case of stable Grotendieck polynomials. And uh, this is joint work with Jennifer Morse um, on Stanley symmetric functions, crystals for Stanley symmetric functions. And then also with uh, Jennifer Morse, Jinping Pan, and Wen Chin Po, who are uh, two of my students um, on the on the crystal for a stable Grotendieck polynomial. So let me start. I mean, most of you, uh, I guess, are, are experts on crystals, but let me just very briefly say um, what I'm using from crystal theory. So in this talk, I will mostly talk about crystals for type A because I'm going to be interested in uh, symmetric functions that can be expanded into sure functions. And it turns out that um, the connected components of a type A crystal, are, uh, the character of those are precisely given by sure functions. So the a, a crystal is basically a graph with vertices um, and colored edges. And the edges are colored by um, the, the simple roots of a dinking diagram. So for me, since I'm in this talk, I'm going to consider type A. If we are looking at type A and minus one, then the, the edges would be labeled by colors from one up to N minus one. So in this example that I've given here, um, this would be an A2 crystal because we have two colors like the blue arrows and the red arrows. Um, and here I've actually considered a tensor product of two crystals. So a crystal labeled by just a single box and a crystal labeled uh, or indexed by uh, the partition 2, 1. And then you can see that um, the, the crystal decomposes in this case into three connected components. And as I said, so the, the connected components actually correspond to irreducible um, components, if you think about it in terms of representation theory. And well, if you look at the character of the crystal, so that would be the sum over uh, all vertices in the crystal x to the weight of a vertex. So for type A, 
this would just be counting the number of ones in your tableau, the number of twos into your, in, in your tableau and so on. So this is called the character of the crystal. And for type A, the character of each connected component is precisely a sure function. So if you look at the highest weights, the elements at the very top of the crystal, then um, uh, the, the sure function would be indexed by the partition uh, of the highest weight. Okay, and let me just very briefly review how the crystal operators act on words or tableau for type A. So if you look at a word in the letters, let's say from one up to N, then uh, if you want to consider the crystal operators EI or FI, where I runs from is a letter one up to n minus one, then you consider the letters i and i plus one. Um, and if you do it in terms of a tableau, then you would look at the row reading word of the tableau to get to get a word. And then you successively bracket um, all letters when when you see an i plus one before an i then you sort of remove those. And at the end of the day, once you successively do this bracketing, you are left with the word of the form I to the R, I plus one to the S, okay? And then on, on the sub word, um, the EI operator makes an I plus one into an I. So if you have here the exponents R and S, then under the E operator, the exponent will be S minus one and R plus one. And if there is no I plus one, then the EI operator would kill it. And similarly, an FI operator uh, makes an I into an I plus one. So that's how the crystal operators uh, act for, for type A crystals on words. So that's very nice. Um, so crystal theory is like a very powerful tool. And now what we want to do is we want to um, apply that to get a sure expansion for the, for the Stanley symmetric functions. So I want to, what I want to do is I want to give you a crystal for the Stanley symmetric functions, and then we will upgrade that to a crystal for Grotendieck polynomials. So let me first briefly say how you can define Stanley symmetric functions. So one way you can get the Stanley symmetric functions is by looking at Schubert polynomials and taking the stable limit of Schubert polynomials. And I should also say, so the Stanley symmetric functions are indexed by, uh, by permutations in SN. If your permutation W that indexes the Stanley symmetric function is three to one avoiding, then in fact, the Stanley symmetric function is also equal to a skew sure function. And I guess we all know the Littlewood Richardson rule. So if you have a skew sure function, you can actually write that as a sum of sure functions and the coefficients are precisely the Littlewood Richardson coefficients. So if um, W is three to one avoiding, then we immediately get uh, the sure expansion of these Stanley symmetric functions. And well, they were introduced by Stanley and he also showed that they're actually symmetric functions. And then Edelman and Green showed that they're actually sure positive. So what we are interested in in the first part of the talk is these coefficients, A, W, Lambda, um, so we want to get a, a crystal theoretic interpretation for these coefficients, A, W, Lambda. And they turn out to be uh, uh, positive integers. So one reason why Stanley symmetric functions are important is because if you look at the square free term of the Stanley symmetric function, the coefficient of this term actually counts the reduced words of W. So let me just briefly say what I mean by a reduced word. So the um, symmetric group Sn is generated by simple transpositions S1 up to Sn minus one. 
So SI just interchanges the letters I and I plus one. And these operators, these generators uh, satisfy relations. So when I and J are far apart, so at least two apart, then they commute with each other. So that's this first relation. If they are adjacent, then they satisfy the braid relation. So as I as I plus one as I is equal to as I plus one as I as I plus one. And then they also square to, to one. So as I squares equal to the identity. Um, and so here's an example. Here's a permutation in one line notation. So this means one is mapped to three, two is mapped to two, three is mapped to one, four is mapped to four. Um, then in terms of our generators, this can be written as as I as two, uh, sorry, as one, as two, as one. But by our braid relation, this is also equal to as two, as one, as two. Both of these are um, reduced words for this permutation because they are the, sh the shortest uh, way of writing the permutation in terms of the generators. Here's another way of writing um, this permutation in terms of the generators, but this would not be reduced because the S3, you can, the S3 times S3, you can, by, by this uh, relation is also equal to the identity. Okay, so the first two are reduced words and the last is not a reduced word. So now I'm ready to define the, the um, Stanley symmetric functions. So as I said, they're indexed by a permutation W and I'm going, oops, sorry. I'm going to define them as the sum over all decreasing factorizations of W. So what do I mean by this? Well, I'm going to take my W and I'm going to write my W as a product of permutations V upper R up to V upper one. And each of these V upper I should be strictly decreasing. So it should be a reduced word that is strictly decreasing. I will give examples in a moment. And then I also require that this is a length preserving factorization so if I add up the length of each of the factors, that should be indeed the length of my, my W. So the length is just equal to the number of generators I need uh, when I write it as a reduced word. And then uh, my Stanley symmetric function is the sum over all such decreasing factorizations. And then I take um, Xi to the length of the the i-th factor. Okay, so that's the definition of the Stanley symmetric function. Here's an example. So here I'm going to take uh, the permutation two one four three. The a reduced expression would be s one times s three because I'm interchanging two and one, and I'm also interchanging four and three, and they are in fact two reduced expressions as one as three and also as three as one, right? Because if the letters are far apart, then, then the two generators just commute. And here I've listed now um, all possible decreasing factorizations of this W. So I uh, you can either put S1 and S3 in separate uh, factors, so the first two are given like that. And then you can also put S3 and S1 together in a factor, but then the three has to come first and then the S1 because I'm uh, requiring that the larger, the, uh, the SI with the larger index should come first. And uh, by the way, in this example, I've assumed now that I have two factors. And here you can see for these last two factorizations, one of the factors is actually empty. Okay, and then I um, associate to each such factorization a monomial, which is just given by xi to the length of the i-th factor. And uh, note that I'm counting my uh, factors from right to left. So this, this one is factor one, 
and this one is factor two. So I'm going from right to left. Okay, so the, the, these are the monomials that I, I assign to each of those factorizations. And therefore my Stanley symmetric function, uh, if I assume that uh, I only allow two factors, then this would be given by the polynomial two x1, x2, because they are two factorizations that give me an x1, x2. And then I have two factorization, one factorization that gives me an x1 squared and one that gives me an x2 squared. Oh, so I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, uh, I, can, 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 I, can I have a question? Okay. Yes, sure. Yes, yes. Uh, 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 R is just length of LW, R. Oh, R, no, uh, okay, so I'm fixing R in this case. R is equal to two. In my example, you can uh, fix a particular R, you can fix the length, the number of factors that you want to have. So, so okay. if you fix R, then this would be a polynomial in R variables. Oh, uh, okay. So, thank you. If you want to consider um, actually symmetric functions, not just symmetric polynomials, then R could be arbitrary, but then you would have a lot of empty factors. But in this example, for me, R is equal to two, and then uh, I just have a polynomial and, and two variables. Uh, does that make sense? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Okay, um, so now what I want to do is sort of reinterpret our rules, our bracketing rules that I stated at the beginning of the talk. Remember, I, I told you that if you want to um, uh, consider EI, you look at the letters I and I plus one and you perform a certain bracketing or pairing, right? So um, here I have a skew tableau the way that you do the bracketing is you read everything row wise. I'm doing this in French notation. So you can read everything row wise and then you pair the, um, whenever you see here, I'm, I'm going to consider E2. So whenever you see a three, you want to pair it with a two that comes afterwards. So here um, I have, highlighted in red one of the pairings. So I've, high, I've paired the red three with the red two. And then I've also paired the purple three with the purple two, right? So those would be the two letters that, the, the letters that are paired. And the remaining um, twos and threes are not paired in this example. And then the E2 actually takes the leftmost unpaired three and makes it into a two. So this blue three that you can see is ma made into a two under the E2 operator. So this is just translating what I stated before for the crystal operators in terms of this skew tableau. So now I want to give you a slightly different interpretation for this, which will then uh, give us a crystal for the Stanley symmetric functions. So instead of looking at words, I'm now actually going to look at the, the sort of the residues of the, or the content of the, the letters. So I'm starting here with this uh, three in the, top left corner, and I'm going to say that this is diagonal one, then this would be diagonal two, diagonal three, diagonal four, five, six, and so on. So I'm basically just labeling the, diag the, the, the cells by their diagonals, okay? And then um, you can now uh, sort of record the, the letters, three in your tableau using the diagonal lab labelings. So for example, the, the, the rightmost three has content 10. So that's what I'm recording here. And then the next three has content nine. So that's what I'm recording 
here and so on and so on. So I'm just going to record the diagonal labels um, of the threes or in general of the i plus ones in decreasing order. So this first factor that you can see just gives us the content um, of all the diagonal labelings of all the threes. And then I do the same for the twos. So the twos look sit in the diagonals seven, five, and four. So I put those into, uh, into a factor. Okay, and um, now what I'm claiming is that you this pairing that we have done where you pair an I plus one with an I can actually also be uh, done by, by the following rule, namely you now start with your left factor and you go from biggest to smallest and you try to pair a letter with a bigger letter, the smallest letter that is bigger in the right factor. So in particular, the 10, there's nothing bigger in this factor, so it's not paired. Same for the nine, same for the eight, but for the six, there is a letter that is bigger in the right factor, namely the seven, and that's the smallest one that is bigger. So I'm going to pair the six, so sorry, the six with the seven. And then similarly, the one is paired with the smallest number that's bigger in the right factor. So the one is paired with the four. And as you can see, um, the coloring is the same as in the tableau, right? So this is actually the same pairing as what we've done previously under this map. Okay, and then how does an E, the E2 operator act? Well, it basically takes the rightmost um, unpaired letter in the left factor, which corresponds to the threes, so in this case, the eight, and it moves it to the right to the uh, to, to this factor. So what you get is then the eight has moved to the right. And that corresponds exactly to changing a three in our original tableau to a two, okay? And there's just uh, one little, so this works very well if, if the letter that you move, in this case, the eight, is not obstructed by anything. But um, here I've given you another example where that's not the case. So if you look at this example at the bottom of the slide, all the letters that are paired are given in red. Okay, so for example, this eight is paired with this nine and so on. And the rightmost unpaired letter is the blue six. But if you try to move that six over, um, it actually sits next to a five. And if you just moved it over, it wouldn't be possible because there's also already a six in the right factor. So what you actually have to do is you need to use these braid relations that I uh, told you about before. And if you do that, then this letter six, when you try to move it over, actually becomes a four. The, this red four and in, in the uh, sorry the blue four and the and the right factor. Okay, so um, you basically make the rightmost letter into another letter on on the right, but sometimes using braid relations, it becomes a different letter in the right factor. Okay, so these will now be our crystal operator on these decreasing factorizations. And um, the claim is that this actually gives us a crystal. So the, the vertices of my crystal are just the decreasing factorizations. The edges are imposed uh, by the e, uh, EI and uh, FI operators that I've just defined by this bracketing and then moving uh, a letter over. And then the highest weights are the vertices with no unpaired entries where you cannot uh, move anything over or alternatively they are delete, they are killed by an EI operator. And what I uh, proved with Jennifer Morse is that this indeed gives us a crystal of type AL, so, or I should say of AR. So L or R are precisely the number of factors 
that I allow in my decreasing factorization. And the way that we prove that is we just check that the Stembridge local axioms are satisfied. So that's how we prove that these are indeed, um, this is indeed a, a crystal, of, crystal graph of type A. And here, here's an example or two examples actually. Um, I've taken again the, the word, the, the W as three times as one. And then you can see that there are two connected components and we have two highest weight vectors in this case. One is of um, weight two and the other one is of weight one one. So this is now telling us that the, the Stanley symmetric function indexed by the permutation as three times S1 is equal to S2 plus S11 because we have two connected components. Similarly, if you take the permutation given by S2 times S1, it only has one component um, and therefore this, the Stanley symmetric function would be equal to a sure function. So the, the general theorem is that um, the Stanley symmetric functions yeah, expand in terms of the Schur functions and these A, W, lambda in, count exactly the highest weight elements in this crystal that I've just described. So that is um, another way of, um, yeah, this, this is a crystal theoretic way of describing these coefficients. And here's another example so here, because we have two components, my Stanley symmetric function is precisely the sum of two sure functions, S2 plus S11. And another thing that we proved is that um, um, the, 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 uh, the crystal, this decomposition that, that we are given, um, uh, actually commutes or the, the crystal operator commute with the Edelman green insertion. So if you take the Edelman green insertion um, and you look at the recording tableau of the Edelman green insertion, then this precisely um, intertwines with the crystal operators. So this crystal operator here would just be the usual crystal operator on a semi-standard Young tableau. And this crystal operator here is this crystal operator that I just defined on these decreasing factorizations. Okay, so that's great. We have um, a nice way of getting the, the Schur expansion of Stanley symmetric functions. And now I want to take it a step further and actually look at crystals for Grotendieck polynomials. So let me briefly um, review for you how you can define the Grotendieck polynomials. So if you look at Schubert calculus and you look at the Grassmannian and the cohomology, then the Schur functions would be associated to the Grassmannian. If you upgrade this to K-theory, you get um, Grotendieck polynomials. And if you actually look at, instead of the Grassmannian, you look at flag varieties, then, well, in the stable limit, you get the Stanley symmetric functions. And in the K-theory, um, you would get stable Grotendieck polynomials. Okay, so they were introduced, the, the Grassmannian Grotendieck polynomials were introduced by Lascou and Schützenberger, and the stable Grotendieck polynomials were introduced by Fomin and Kirillov. And what we want to do now is uh, again, find a crystal for these, um, the, yeah, for, for the combinatorial object that underlie these symmetric functions. And what we are going to do is we are going to de, um, combine the, the approach that I've just described for you, the one on decreasing factorizations for the Stanley symmetric functions and a crystal structure on the, the um, Grassmannian Grotendieck polynomials um, in terms of set value tableau given by Monika, Pechenik, and Scrimshaw. So we are going to sort of combine those two and then 
find a crystal structure for the stable Grotendieck polynomial uh, in the case when W is three to one avoiding. So that's the plan for the, the rest of this talk. So to uh, tell you what the underlying combinatorial objects are, I first need to define the zero hacker monoid. Okay, so this will now take the place of these decreasing factorizations in the symmetric group that I described before for the Stanley symmetric functions. So here the relations are that uh, P times P is not anymore the identity, but this is um, equivalent to P. And then we also have the analog of the break relation. So PQP is equivalent to QPQ. And then when P and Q are far apart, they commute again. So these will be the relations. So here are some examples. If I take the word 2112, then because PP is equal to P or congruent to P, this is also uh, congruent to 212. And this is also congruent to 1 to 1 because of our braid relation. If I take 2, 1, 2, 1, then um, if I use the braid relation on the first three letters, this would be 1, 2, 1, 1. And then the 1 times 1, I can combine to a 1. So this is also congruent to um, 1 to 1. And then by the braid relation, this is also congruent to 2, 1, 2. And here's the last example. So three, one, three, one, two. Um, if you use um, the braid relation on the second, third, and fourth letter, you would get three, one, three. And then you can combine the first and second letter to a three. So this is also congruent to three, one, three, two. Um, and then three and one commute with each other. So this is also congruent to three, one, two, which is also congruent to one, three, two, because uh, three and one commute with each other. Okay, so now I'm John, going- uh, So sorry, I, I have yes. a question. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, can you uh, can you decide, uh, for example, there, there are two, two elements of zero hook monoid. Can you exactly, uh, understand uh, that the two is just the same or different. I, I, I mean that you, you can, you can you decide exactly representative of this monoid? Can I uh, your question is if I, if you give me two words, can I, can I immediately tell you whether they are congruent to each other? Okay. Yes. Uh, is that your question? Yes. Um, well, I mean, the, the, the way that um, I know how to do it is by just using these relations that I've given you. I mean, just try to find the sequence of relations um, and that transforms one into the other. And there are actually infinitely many um, elements that are all congruent to each other because you can make your words arbitrarily long, right? Because you can always use uh, that PP is equal to P, so you can always increase the, the length of your words. Uh, does that answer your question? Sorry, I, I, uh, uh, so uh, I, I mean that uh, can, you, uh, can, uh, can you know the somehow basis of uh, this monoid, I, I mean that uh, uh, typical form of rep rep representative of this monoid. So, uh, so you mean a representative in each class? Each class. So, it, it, uh, how to say? Um, yeah, uh, so simp simple, simple re form of representative. You, you can know. Yeah. So, a representative for each congruence class would be. A reduced word in SN. Uh, okay, thank, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to um, 
define the analog of decreasing factorizations, but now in this zero Hecker monoid. So um, if, we, if we take a word in this zero Hecker monoid, then we, are, we want to again uh, factor it. Okay, so now I, I use M factors instead of R factors, but I, I hope that doesn't matter. So um, we, we want to factor H into um, M factors such that again, each factor is uh, strictly decreasing. And we want that, well, if, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, if I use this congruence relation, then H would be congruent to W in, in the second monoid. And then I'm going to call H W M the set of decreasing factorizations um, of W in, uh, into M factors. So here is, is an example. So here's actually a reduced word in S3. So that would be a representative of a congruence class. And now here I'm going to look at factors into three fact, uh, factorization into three factors um, of words of length five in the zero Hecker monoid. Okay, and here they're they're all listed, right? So you can see again that each factor is is decreasing. Three one is decreasing. 3, 2 is decreasing and so on. Um, so yeah, the, 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 these would be the factorizations of length five into three factors of um, this W. And now we are going to define the stable Grotendieck polynomial um, as follows. So now we are going to um, look at all decreasing factorizations in the zero Hecker monoid, we take again the weight to be xi to the length of the ith factor, but now there's an extra parameter beta, which is given by what is called the exceedance. So you look at the length of the all of the factors and you subtract from that the length of the the representative of, uh, in your symmetric group. So the length of W in the symmetric group. Okay, so um, here's, here's an example. So if W, which is now again a, a, a reduced word in S3, but it's also a word in, in the zero Hecker monoid, um, then if we want to look at the decreasing factorizations into uh, words of length three, so in this case, this would correspond to a term beta to the zero, then um, here are decreasing factorizations. And therefore the, the term uh, beta to the zero would look like this. So the red terms, uh, come from the the red um, decreasing factorizations. If you also allow to put in empty factors, and then the blue term here corresponds to the the blue factorizations, and you can see that this is actually equal to the sure function s to one. Okay, and well, it is already known by Fomin and Green that. The, these stable uh, Grotendieck polynomials have a positive sure expansion, and they even give a, a, an interpretation for for the the fact for for these coefficients, namely they are given by um, semi-standard Young tableau such that the column reading word is uh, congruent to the W that that it's indexed by. And here, here's an example. So if you look at the stable Grotendieck polynomial indexed by 1, 3, 2, then the constant term, as we've already seen, is S to 1. But then um, this, is, this would be an infinite series um, in terms of the betas. Um, and here are the first couple of sure functions that appear in this expansion. 
So what we want to do now is find, again, a crystal theoretic interpretation for these numbers. Okay, so now we have to do the heavy lifting. We have to actually define the crystal. Okay, and as I said, I'm only going to do that for what I call three to one avoiding um, words. So my W now um, should not contain any braids. So if you look at any reduced expression for W, then it should not contain any word of the form I, I plus one I. So here, here are some examples. If you look at one, three, two, one, then this is equivalent to three, one, two, one. So the one, two, one would be a braid. So this particular element is not three, two, one avoiding. On the other hand, if I look at this particular word, then this is congruent to two, one, three, two, which is also congruent to two, three, one, two by interchanging the one and the three because they commute. And those are actually um, both reduced words for this particular element. And there are no braids. So this one would be three to one avoiding. So I'm going to call the set of all decreasing factorizations into M factors um, for a three to one avoiding W. I'm going to call this HM star. So this is the set that I'm going to be interested in. Right, so my first factorization here is not an H3 star because that contains a braid, but the other examples that I've given, they are all elements. And um, so the first one is, is an H2 star because we have two factors, and the second one would be, would be an H3 star because we have three factors. Okay, and now I'm going to explain to you uh, how we define a crystal on this. And it is very similar to the crystal on the Stanley symmetric functions, except for the bracketing, instead of pairing something uh, on the left with something in, in the right factor, remember before we were always pairing something with a letter that's strictly bigger. Now I'm actually, pair, I'm going to allow pairing with something that is equal to that letter. So that's in the pairing, this is the only difference. So we are going to look at the largest letter B um, in H I plus one, in, in that factor H I plus one, and we pair it with the smallest letter that is bigger or equal to this letter. And then we, we proceed um, as previously for the Stanley symmetric function crystal. Okay, and then how do we actually define the crystal operators? So for the uh, Stanley symmetric function crystal, remember we took a letter and moved it. Um, so here I'm now actually de describing the FI operator. So I'm going to take a letter from HI and I'm going to try to move it to the factor HI plus one. So um, if the letter x plus one is uh, in both hi and hi plus one, then I remove this letter from the right factor and I make it into an x in the, in the left factor. And if x plus one is not in both of the factors, then I just remove the x from the right factor and I move it to the left factor. Okay, so here, here's an example. If I look at this factor, this decreasing factorization, then the bracketing would go as follows. I look at my one and I bracket it with the smallest number that is bigger or equal. So I'm bracketing it with the two. And then the F1 operator moves the three to the left factor. Here's another um, uh, example. So in this case, my bracketing would bracket the five with the six. So those are the red letters. The three cannot be bracketed, but the two can be bracketed with the two, right? So now I'm allowing equal letters to be bracketed. So the two green 
uh, twos are bracketed. And then um, I want to move, so my, my X, which is the largest unpaired letter is, is the one. I'm trying to move it over, but the two is in both the right and the left factor. So therefore I'm going to move a one to the, to the left factor. So those are my, my crystal rules for, for, um, for this crystal. Okay, so here, here's an, a bigger example. So here I'm now going to look at the Grotendieck polynomial index by one, three, two. And I'm going to actually now look at this term with the beta. So I'm looking at words of length four into three factors. And I've listed all 12 decreasing factorizations on the left. And then using the crystal operator that I have just describe, we get three connected components. Okay, so here I have uh, one with highest weight, three, one, mm -hmm. three, two. And then I have two other uh, components um, given by the highest weight vectors, one, one, three, two, and one, three, three, two. So, if you look at the weights of these highest weights, the, the weight of this one is 2, 2. So that corresponds to the sure function as 2, 2. And these other two highest weights have weight 2, 1, 1. So they correspond to um, this, uh, this element in the, in the sure expansion, the 2, as 2, 1, 1. OK, so that's. Um, yeah, that's the description of, of the crystal. And now what we want to do is we want to explore this more and look at the properties of this crystal. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. So in the last couple of minutes of my talk, what I want to do is explore some of the properties. And in particular, um, what I first want to do is I want to look at a different combinatorial interpretation for these Grotendieck polynomials when they're indexed by skew partitions. So not a W, but a skew partition. So Buch gave a different sort of combinatorial interpretation, namely in terms of what are called set-valued tableau. So a set value, a semi-standard set-valued tableau is very similar to a semi-standard tableau, but instead of just putting numbers into each box, we are now going to put sets in each box. Okay, and then I need to tell you what I mean by semi-standard. So um, in, in each row, I want a weak increase, but what do I mean by weak increase when we are comparing sets? So I need to compare the maximum of the set A with the minimum of the set B. So that's how we compare uh, things in the same row. And then if we compare things in the same column, I want that the maximum of A is strictly smaller than the minimum of C. So here are some examples. Here I have written, well, three sort of, uh, three um, sort of fillings of the shape three, two, modded out by one, so that my skew shape is three, two, modded out by one. And let's check which of the fillings actually are semi-standard. So if we look here, if, if we look at the first example, you can see that the mac in each row, the maximum of the left element is less or equal to the minimum of the, the right one. And also, if you compare um, this column in the middle, the maximum of this set, the 2, 1, is 2. And if we compare that to the, the minimum of this, then you can see that the max of the bottom one is uh, strictly smaller than the minimum of the top one. But if you look at the second example, um, here, the maximum of this is four, 
but the minimum of this is three. So this is actually not semi-standard. And similarly, if you look at the last example, the, the maximum of the one four is four, but that is bigger than the minimum of this set. So this is also not semi-standard. So of these examples, only the first one is actually a semi-standard filling of, of the shape. Uh, now let me briefly describe the crystal structure on the set value tableau given by Monica, Pechenik, and Scrimshaw. So what they do is they assign to every column in T that contains an I, but not an I plus one, a minus sign. And then they assign a plus sign to every column in T containing an I plus one, but not an I. And then uh, what they do is they, they pair um, all the pluses with, with the minuses. Okay, similar to what we did before when we when we paired i plus ones with i's. Okay, so here's an example. Here I'm now I want to do an F2 operator. So I look at the letters two and three. You can see that the first column contains a three, so I give it a plus. The second column contains a two, so I give it a minus, and the last column contains a two, so I also give it a minus. Columns one and two are paired. So therefore, by the way that the crystal operators work, the rightmost unpaired, sorry, the leftmost, no, sorry, the rightmost unpaired minus will make a two and two a three. And that's exactly what happens in this example. There is one particular case which is spelled out. Um, in, in the second case, so in some cases, when the right neighbor of the letter that you want to change actually contains both an I plus I and I plus one, then you have to do something slightly different. And this is because you want to um, you want to still have the answer to be semi-standard. So here's an example where that happens. In the second example, I want to apply an F4. So I look at all the letters uh, four and five. You can see my first column has only a four. My second column has both a four and five. So I don't assign a plus or minus. And then the last column has a five. So I assign it a plus. Uh, and therefore the F4 operator would like to change the four in, in this cell to a five, but then as you can see, this wouldn't be semi-standard anymore. So therefore it actually moves a five uh, from the right one over and the, the answer is equal to this. So this is how you define um, the, the crystal on these set value tableau. So one uh, thing that we proved in our paper is that the following that under the residue map that I defined for you. So remember the residue map looks at the residues or the diagonals of um, each box. And then it maps a, a, a semi-standard tableau or in this case, a set value tableau to a factorization. Um, this residue map intertwines the Monica Pachenik Scrimshaw operators, crystal operators, with the operators that we defined on these decreasing factorizations for uh, in, in the zero Hecker monoid. So here's an example. If you look at um, this, this particular set value tableau, then in red, I've given you the residues. I've also given you below what the Monica Pachenik Scrimshaw crystal operators would do. So under the residue map, this would be mapped to this factorization, right? So the three one, for example, comes from the fact that we have a three with residue three and a three with a residue one. So that gives us this factor. And similarly, there's a two with residue three. So that's why we get um, this factor with a three. 
And then finally, we have a one with residue three and a one with residue two. So that gives us this factor. And then our crystal operators, the F1, well, it would pair the three with the three, and then it actually moves a two over under, under our rules. And um, yeah, this diagram commutes. So the, the residue um, map intertwines these two crystal operators. So that is one of the results. Um, then another result that we have is we actually uh, came up with a new insertion operator, uh, an insertion algorithm, which we call the star insertion. Um, and um, let me basically define that in terms of an example. So here we have a factorization, a, a decreasing factorization, four, two, four, two, three, one. So you can write this um, as a two, a, a, an array with, with two rows. In the bottom row, I put my uh, my letters in the factorization. And in the top row, I just record um, in which factor the letter is in. So for example, this four, two um, is in the third factor. So therefore I record that with a three, three on top. Okay, so now how does this star insertion work? Well, I start from the right and I'm, I'm inserting the letter in the bottom row, which is a one, and I'm going to record it with the one on the top. Okay, so in the first step, nothing interesting happens. Then I'm going to insert the three. The three will just be appended on the right. And I record it with the letter on the top. Then the two will bump the, the three. And again, I will I record it with a two in my um, recording tableau. Then I insert the four, which is appended to the right. And now something interesting happens. So now I'm actually trying to uh, insert the two, but there is already a letter two in my row. So um, the, that two will bump the two up and um, it makes what happens. So if you, if you read the rules here, what it will do, it will spit out the, the, the number that is sort of in an interval um, starting at the two. So you look at the, the, the sort of largest interval or, or consecutive numbers that go to the left of the two, and that is the number that will be bumped up. So in this case, this will be the one, and then the one, one bumps up the three. And then, Finally, we do the same for the four. So there is already a four um, in our uh, in our tableau. So it will it will bump a four up. And then um, what what we showed is that the following diagram commutes. That if you look at the recording tableau under the star insertion, um, then this actually commutes with the crystal operators on semi-standard tableau. So if you do a crystal uh, that we defined on these decreasing factorizations, and you look at the um, recording tableau um, under this insertion, that will be a semi-standard Young tableau, and you use the usual crystal operators, then this diagram commutes. So here's an example our star insertion operator would um, would make this decreasing factorization into this decreasing factorization. Under the star insertion, if you look at the recording tableau, the recording tableau exactly makes this one into a two. And since I'm almost out of time, let me uh, just very briefly mention that um, we, so on, set value tableau, there's also something called an uncrowding operator. So that makes the uncrowding, well, since we just went through the COVID pandemic, right, you don't want to have 
too many things in a single box. So you want to uncrowd the, the cells. You do that by RSK. So I don't want to go through all the details. Um, but then this star insertion is also well behaved with respect to this uncrowding operator. So if you uncrowd a set value tableau, then um, and you do the residue map and this, this star insertion, there's a relation between that. There's also a hacker insertion. So let me just go through that very quickly. And uh, under this hacker insertion, um, if you look at the residue map and the, the hacker insertion, there's also a relation. So that's what this slide is saying. And then finally, to conclude, let me briefly say that while our crystal currently only works for the three to one avoiding case, so it would be very interesting to see what happens, uh, whether one can upgrade this to the non three to one avoiding case. And um, also, can we actually define some Demazur crystal structure to compute um, intersection numbers? Uh, thank you very much. Is there a question? Yeah, please. So just uh, have the following question. So if uh, we will look uh, on the B infinity, and then we can uh, 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 think about the uh, element of the Hecke algebra as passes in the B infinity, namely, if we have uh, a crystal operation Fi, then and we instead of Fi will consider Fi in the maximal power. Uh, which gives uh, uh, non-zero action, then such operators, uh, they correspond to zero Hecke algebra. So therefore, so if we just look on B infinity and then we have element of this uh, zero Hecke algebra, then we can uh, imagine it like a pass uh, in this B infinity or just only a pair of points, but it is just for all elements. So we just have any B infinity and then we have pass. And then, uh, so therefore, you uh, consider this crystal operation in some sense on such passes in B infinity. And my question is: Is any relation between a crystal operation on so crystal graph on B infinity and the set of these uh, passes, which correspond to uh, words in Hecke algebra? Uh, uh, so is there any, any relation between two crystal operations? So we we'll start from crystal operation, then we we'll consider passes, and then we uh, you uh, explain some crystal operation on the passes. Yeah, this yeah. is a very interesting question. I haven't I haven't thought about this. So you are saying you want to look at B infinity for yeah. type A. Yes. Okay, and then you're saying uh, if you look at the F i to the highest power that does not kill yeah. the element that would also be a zero hacker that yes. would yeah that's uh -huh. a zero hacker uh relation uh huh okay and this for example answer for the question how to check that if we have two words uh, in zero hacker so how to check if uh, they are equal or not so we just uh -huh. generic uh, element in B infinity and apply uh, uh, two uh, crystal operations follow these words. And if they give the same answer, so they are equal. If not, then not. So probably uh -huh. the easiest way to just to check. So thank you. OK, yeah, th th that's a very interesting comment. Uh, is, is there any? Ah, sorry. Ah, thank you. Hi, Anna. Thank you for the talk. Uh, can you? Uh, at the very end, you said Demazur with intersection. Do you mean like proper Demazur crystals or something related to Lascu polynomials? Well, I meant the former, but yeah, looking at uh, Lascu polynomials would also be interesting. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, is, is there other questions? Okay. Uh, I, I'm Masato. Oh, yeah, happy birthday. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I thought I should prove that I'm present here. 
Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I have one question. Uh, yeah. So uh, today's talk uh, that's uh, for ty type A crystal. Yes. And is there any uh, example that uh, ty type uh, for, uh, B or C uh, uh, other than A uh, appears uh, in uh, like such business like uh, Schubert poly polynomial or Grassmannian? Yeah. yeah, that's a very good question. So actually, I have some work with my students. Um, Graham Hawke and Kirill Paramonov. So he, they, with, with them, we looked at Stanley symmetric functions for type C. Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, actually, even though they are Stanley symmetric functions of type C, there's still a positive Schuh expansion. So um, we found a crisp, but again, a type A crystal structure on these. And mm -hmm. But the, the thing is that for those Stanley symmetric functions, you can actually also look at expansions in terms of sure P functions. And to do that, this, will, this actually relates to what Professor Kwan is talking about, the super Lie algebras or super crystals. So in that case, you actually get um, an action of a queer super Lie algebra, and then you get the uh, sure P expansion. But uh, I don't yet know of actually a type C crystal structure on, on these objects. Yes, thank you. Is there other questions? Another questions? Uh, if, if there is no question more, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much. You are talk. Thank you. Nice talk. Yeah, thank you. Next.